Pennsylvania has over 60 working breweries today. Okay, that's not a big number compared to the beer making glory days about 100 years ago. But beer making in Pennsylvania today, ah, it's alive and well. And it's growing by astronomical proportions, over 400% in the last six years. Now, to understand where these new breweries are coming from, we need to take a look back, back to a time in which American brewing went from a vibrant, broad industry to a handful of companies making only one style of beer. John Wagner is generally credited with brewing the first lager beer in America. Uh, Wagner started brewing in a small brewery in about 1840 uh, that is just about where the Ortlieb Brewery would be and is still today, except it's closed like a lot of other Philadelphia breweries. Um, Wagner brewed this lager beer for a small but growing flood of German and Central European immigrants. Uh, that flood would really grow when the German revolutions took place in the 1840s and failed and a lot of Germans left uh, to escape persecution. They came to America, they wanted their lager beer, and American brewers were happy to make it for them. The uh, lager brewing increased during the Civil War when these Germans went to war for their new country. Uh, the uh, Germans, German Americans joined the Union Army in droves, sometimes whole regiments of them, and the lager beer wagons followed them wherever their regiment would go. By the turn of the 20th century, there were over 2,000 breweries in America. Prohibition in 1920 would change that, putting over 75% of them permanently out of business. Prohibition prohibited people from drinking, but it didn't take away their thirst. So they either made a low-grade homebrew, literally in their bathtubs with corn grits, raisins, cake yeast, whatever they could get hold of that would make beer, or they bought the products of illicit breweries, either um, side operations of real breweries that were making near beer, or um, completely illegal breweries, often criminals. Uh, these breweries used uh, cheaper ingredients, uh, not all barley malt. They used what's called the high gravity system, uh, where a, a really strong beer is brewed quickly and then watered down to make regular strength beer. And they didn't use very many hops. Uh, hops are pretty much only used for brewing beer, and federal enforcement agents weren't real stupid, so they knew that, and they would, would trace that down. So these guys were making beer that was lighter in weight, they were making beer that had less barley in it, was sweeter, and they had, were brewing beer that had fewer hops in it. And for 14 years, that's what people got used to. In fact, for 14 years, people pretty much drank anything that was called beer. These changes brought on some long-term effects. The corn and rice and high-gravity brewing produced a distinctly lighter-bodied beer with an identifiable non-barley taste. Low hopping rates made for a sweeter beer. Over Prohibition's 14 years, people got used to light lager beer. The process continued over the next three decades, and the popularity of America's light lager created a handful of big national brewers who came to dominate all markets. In the 1970s, these mega nationals put many regional breweries out of business. But Pennsylvania's regionals are a hearty crew of dedicated brewers who not only survived the dark days of corporate buyouts and leveraged takeovers, but each in their own way discovered individual niche markets and blossomed. Pennsylvania has six regional breweries. That's more than any other state. They include Pittsburgh and Jones, noted for making mainline blue-collar beer. La Trobe, currently owned by a Belgian conglomerate. The Lion, which has survived the last 18 years by making malt soda. Straub, we're standing right in front of it. And the oldest brewery in North America, Yingling. President Andy Jackson was inviting all his friends to the White House when David Yingling started brewing at his Eagle Brewery in Pottsville in 1829. The brewery burned later that year, and the new brewery opened up in 1830 on the slope of Sharps Mountain at 5th and Makatongo Streets. Brewing has been going on here ever since, making D.G. Yingling & Son America's oldest brewery. The brewery is in its fifth generation of family ownership, and the sixth generation is settling nicely into the harness. Those of you with an interest in American history may be thinking, did they brew during Prohibition? During the Prohibition years, my great-grandfather, Frank Yingling, who was running the brewery at the time, um, there were several different ways how the brewery survived. Um, he started up the dairy, uh, the ice cream business, which is right across from our brewery today. Um, he also started dance halls uh, called the Roseland Dance Company up in uh, New York. And then also the brewery itself, we made near beer, which we called Juvo. 
and that was one half of one percent alcohol and of course that was legal uh, through the prohibition years <laughs> When Prohibition was repealed, Yingling was sitting pretty. The dairy business provided a fleet of refrigerated trucks and a steady cash flow. The successful near beer business meant they had retained almost all their trained workers, and the dance halls had made them a lot of friends in big markets. On the day of repeal, Frank turned off the vacuum distillation machine and sent a truckload of Yingling's new winter beer to FDR here at the White House. Happy days, we're here again. They didn't last forever, though. By the 1970s, the brewery was in trouble operating from payroll to payroll as the national mega brewers pushed hard to level all markets. In the end, two things saved the brewery. The dogged loyalty of Schuylkill County beer drinkers and the American Bicentennial in 1976. The Bicentennial raised interest in American history and made the brewery's status as America's oldest a bankable quality. In 1985, Dick Yingling, Jr. bought the brewery from his father. However, he felt continued pressure from the national breweries threatening to throttle his business. He also saw the rising interest in non-mainstream beer and thought there might be a way to tap that market. We had always had porter since the inception of the brewery. We had always had ale, and we had our premium beer. So now we added light beer and this amber lager to our portfolio which gave us six brands of beer uh, to market through our system. And, but we, for some reason, are perceived as a, almost a craft brewer. So people say, well, gee, I didn't know Yingling made light beer. If, if we do, and we make a good light beer. And as people try it, uh, they like it, and they continue to buy it, it seems. So uh, that segment of our, our portfolio is growing very well. First to appear was the Yingling Black and Tan, a premixed blend of porter and premium. People in Schuylkill and Berks counties had been mixing Yingling porter with premium or Lord Chesterfield on their own for years to create a custom-made Black and Tan. When the Northeast Tap Room in Reading had the brewery make up premixed barrels of half porter, half Lord Chesterfield, and sold a lot of it, well, the brewers saw they had a winner. They switched the mix to porter and premium put it in a snazzy 16-ounce can, and released it on the market. Got any black and tan? Became the question every beer distributor in eastern Pennsylvania hated to hear. But it was the lager, a little darker, a little more flavorful, a lot less national, that blew the doors off the brewery. Yingling's lager taps cropped up everywhere in southeastern Pennsylvania. The brewery went to high-gravity brewing for the first time. They put in their first expansion in decades. They went to seven days a week and two shifts and they still couldn't keep up with the demand. We have domestic premium price products that will compete with either a domestic premium beer or an imported beer at domestic pricing. So what we've, I think our future here is uh, we have a tremendous opportunity with this company to uh, continue to grow because we seem to have the brands and the products that people are buying and they like. After years of soul-searching, Dick decided to build a second brewery to satisfy the unending thirst for Yingling. The new brewery is about a mile away and now has a capacity of 1.5 million barrels. Shortly after making that decision, he took an even bigger plunge. Stroh Brewing had shut down its million-and-a-half barrel capacity brewery in Tampa, Florida, and so Dick and his staff flew down to look it over. They weighed the still-growing demand for Yingling and all the untouched markets on the borders of Pennsylvania against the timeline for the new Pottsville Brewery. A big, ready-to-run brewery solved a lot of problems, and so they bought it. They hired back most of the laid-off straw workers and were brewing Yingling in just a few months. Even with all this increase in production capacity, Yingling still remains committed to being a regional brewery without any real national aspirations. Their heart's in Pennsylvania, and their central core market is in Pennsylvania, and probably always will be. The old brewery's still running. There's lager in the kettle. There's a fresh keg of porter on in the tap room. Success looks good on the old brewery, and Dick Yingling probably won't be the last of the Yinglings after all. Okay, so it's a little noisy, but hey, we're in a brewery. And speaking of being in a brewery, this is the holy grail for beer enthusiasts. It's called the Eternal Tap. 
We're in St. Mary's, Pennsylvania. We're at the Straub Brewery. And to use the eternal tap, you come on in. Got to be a drinking age, of course. You pour yourself one or two. You clean up after yourself. And the best thing, it's free. This is why Straub Brewery is one of those rare and priceless gems. The Straub Brewery is, by Straub Family Reckoning, the highest brewery in the East, sitting at an elevation between 1,900 and 2,000 feet above sea level. This puts the brewery just below the Eastern Continental Divide, which means, as Dan Straub laughingly puts it, that we get the water first. Uh, it's sort of a joke up here that we use it first, and then we send it down the line to everyone else. It is the smallest regional brewery still in operation, with an annual capacity of 36,000 barrels. Peter Straub came to the United States from Germany in 1869. He came to St. Mary's and soon married Sabina Sorg, whose father owned the local brewery. Peter started his own brewery in 1872, then bought and merged with his father-in-law's brewery in 1876. The copper brew kettle from Sorg's brewery was in continuous use until 1995, when it was finally replaced with a new 160-barrel stainless kettle. The fourth generation of the family is running the brewery now, and the fifth is working there. Dan Straub runs the operation and is not only proud of the product, but extremely proud of his employees. And he's got good reason to be proud. They're doing a great job. The main worry at Straub is how to control the brand's growth so they don't outgrow the brewery. One of our, our main goals is, is quality rather than quantity. We're very happy with are the integrity of the product, which my uncles and grandfathers have always strived for rather than size. They are one of my uncle's favorite sayings when he met with Augie Bush was, uh, Augie said, L little breweries, little problems, big breweries, big problems. And that is very true today. And I'm sure his son would say the same thing because it's a, it's a doggy dog world. It's really tough out there. So we believe that quality is better than quantity. Why does Straub face the happy problem of meeting high demand? Well, Dan Straub gives credit to the growth of microbreweries and the consumer's desire for tastier and fresher beer. Back in 1988, I guess is when the microbrewery craze started. Uh, we're very thankful at Straub's that, that it did get started. The Nationals were pretty much, I was concerned that, that it would turn it out to be uh, something like Coke and Pepsi is now, that you would end up with two breweries. Since 1988, there has been many, many microbreweries that have been very successful, and uh, we attribute a lot of our success to them making the public aware that there is other beers out there, such as Straub's, that they have never tasted before. Straub has always been free of additives, and the label proudly says so. No syrup, no sugar, no salt is added. It's all barley malt, shaved corn, and hops. And since 1989, they've also been making the beer with a bottling date. Yeah, well, you noticed before that Budweiser has a born-on date. We here at Straub's are very proud that we beat them by four or five years to the born-on date. We also beat Pepsi-Cola. So Straub's, I think, is one of the first user-friendly beers on the market today. It's the German ideal. Sell the beer within the smell of the brewery. They sell 60% of their beer right in St. Mary's, and 25% of their sales is draft. That's more than two times the national average. <laughs> Pittsburgh Brewing Company is so well known for its flagship brand, Iron City, that most people think that's the brewery's name. Pittsburgh Brewing Company is banking its future on Iron City. In fact, much of this town's brewing heritage is reflected in Pittsburgh Brewing Company's brands and corporate lineage. Yes, my grandfather and my great-grandfather were both employed here as Coopers, uh, all from, I don't know when they started, but they were employed here until Prohibition came along, and they were the ones that made and repaired the wooden barrels. Uh, they and themselves were quite a task. Uh, it's becoming a lost art. The Coopers, there's not too many that are handmade anymore. And the Cooper, uh, people don't even know what the Cooper is. If you go to Williamsburg, Virginia, you'll find, see a Cooper there. Other than that, you don't find too many Coopers around. But back in the early days of the breweries, uh, beer was put into wooden barrels, and this is what they did, and they were called Coopers.
The brewery stemmed from one started by Edward Frauenheim in 1861, which brewed Iron City beer. In 1899, that brewery joined forces with the 21 other local brewers to form the consolidated Pittsburgh Brewing Company. So that's pretty much uh, how things were at that time, and we're fortunate to still have a, a brewery here and buildings here that started in 1861, and we're fortunate uh, that we are still here and going as well as we are because there aren't too many places left that can say they're 140 years old, uh, different companies, and still be in the same place where they started. Well, that made for a mighty big brewery. In fact, the largest in a state full of breweries. Until recently, Pittsburgh Brewing remained the biggest independent brewery in Pennsylvania, its annual production hovering consistently around one million barrels. That amount, though, has dropped off recently due to a combination of past labor troubles, poor management, and an assault by Coors Light. Pittsburgh Brewing has issued commemorative cans featuring local sports teams, along with other collectibles, such as the infamous Old Frothing Schlosh. Pittsburgh Brewing did this as a spoof of beer beauty queens, like Miss Rheingold, and they touted the beer as the pale stale ale with the foam on the bottom. Ah, people loved it, and the brewery gave in to years of demand and released it again in 1999. The brewery had great success with Icy Light, Today, though, sales have slipped as the original light beer drinkers, together with the big Iron City drinkers, well, they've just gotten older. Pittsburgh Brewing responded by introducing the fruit-flavored light beer, Icy Cooler. We reintroduced the Icy Cooler, which was brought out about four years ago and had some spikes in sales. We saw the need to remarket this beer, reproduce the beer. We cleaned up the packaging and made it an attractive package. It's in the same category as your coolers. It is a malt-based uh, product. It's light in, in effervescence. It goes right after that light beer market that seems to be very popular. With that, we've dovetailed what we're doing with IC Light in that we are resurging the market. We're keeping the dollar spent in getting back, and we have successfully seen the IC Light drinker coming back to fold. So the brewery has taken some drastic measures. They've hired hot young guns to create a completely new marketing concept for the Iron City brand and the brewery itself. The campaign is built around a retro look that emphasizes city over iron, exactly as Pittsburgh itself is doing in these post-Big Steel years. This is City Living, the new slogan proclaims. After spending time in the Berg, drinking my share of iron, I've been around the country and drunk beers in other places, and I have to say, Iron City is no worse than a lot of beers, and it's better than some. I hope Pittsburghers get the new message, the brewery does well, and they start drinking their own hometown beer again. And then maybe that big brick building up on Liberty will pump iron after iron for years to come. Legend has it that William B. Stoney Jones won the Eureka Brewing Company of Suttersville, Pennsylvania in a card game sometime around the turn of the century. Jones, who was a big-boned Welsh miner, was evidently pretty shrewd for a gambler. He hung on to the brewery and then moved it to Smithton. Supposedly, Stoney wanted to take advantage of artesian wells he found there. Well, that seems kind of odd, given that the present-day brewery sits on the right bank of the Yawkagany River. But you know, a legend is a legend. Another more plausible tale explains the name of the brewery's major beer. Stoney was well known in the area, either from working the mines or from selling his Eureka Gold Crown Lager. The immigrant miners who bought his beer evidently found the name a little too tough to wrap around their tongues, so they just asked for one of Stoney's beers. Stoney was smart enough to bow to the inevitable, and soon the beer was labeled Stoney's. Uh, Stoney's is our flagship brand here. Uh, we've been brewing it since 1907. Uh, we're using basically the same recipe that we have since then. Uh, it is our flagship brand, our mainstay, and hopefully will always be our mainstay. Uh, it's an all-natural product, um, all-grain product. We don't use any additives, any preservatives. We don't add any sugar, and therefore it's a, a fairly, fairly low uh, sugar content in the beer itself. For decades, the brewery remained in the family, a family that included Stoney's granddaughter, actress Shirley Jones. In 1988, it was sold to Sandy and Gabrielle Gabby Podlucky. 
The Podluckies have managed the brewery in true Stony Jones style. That is, realizing for a regional brewery to work and to work well, you must be firmly connected to your community and your customer base. Recently, it looked as if that might not be enough, though. The brewery hit some pretty rough times in the 1990s and almost went out of business. Making it through the 90s had been a lot of fun starting up. Um, we work together as a team here. Everyone here, they get along really good. And um, it's like you work together and you put every effort you have into it and it pays off because um, we came back when we purchased the brewery in the 80s and we came back and we did all the new packaging and, and the beer looked aesthetically nice, you know, and it's a great beer and it's been here since 1907. So there has to be some reason why we have so many wonderful followers. And uh, I mean, hey, it's, it's just a great beer. Um, we like the new Esquire that we have out now. Uh, it just came out about, I'd say, two and a half months ago, maybe three months at the most. And it's really climbing. And it's a great taste. Everywhere you go, people are talking about it. And I think it's going to be one of the hits that's going to carry uh, Stoney's over into the future. Sandy and Gabby are survivors and have made some really tough, smart business decisions. Esquire is a sophisticated looking and very good tasting beer with a bankable future. All the Pudluckies need is a little bit of that old Stoney's legendary luck and the beer will continue to flow from Smithton. Think about that for just a minute as we travel north, north to Latrobe, home of the Latrobe Brewing Company, perhaps Pennsylvania's most unique brewery because 95% of its output is just one beer, Rolling Rock. Ah, Rolling Rock, with its green glass, silk screen bottles, and mysterious 33 labeling, is a great beer that inspires great loyalty. Latrobe Brewing was originally a cadet brewery of Pittsburgh Brewing. After Prohibition, Pittsburgh decided to drop some of its smaller breweries. The trobe was sold to the Tito brothers, who ran it until the 1980s. One of the best moves they made was to create a new beer in 1939. It was Rolling Rock. And on those very first bottles, the motto read, as it does today, Rolling Rock, from the glass-lined tanks of old La Trobe, we tender this premium beer for your enjoyment as a tribute to your good taste. It comes from the mountain springs to you. And at the end of the motto is the number 33. Not sure what it means, actually. There's a lot of theories. One is uh, it's 33 cents to my office. There's 33 letters in the ingredients we use to make Rolling Rock beer. Beer came back in 33 after Prohibition. And maybe the one that I believe, not saying that's the right one, but the one I believe actually is the number of words on the back of the bottle. What does it mean? Well, theories abound. The number of words in the motto? Yes. The number of letters in the ingredients? Yes. The year prohibition was repealed? Yes. Unfortunately, the Tito brothers sold only the brewery and the brands to Labatt and not the corporate archives. So the real meaning of 33? Ah, may be lost forever. What has not been lost forever is the brewery. Labatt has spent a lot of money on this brewery and has renovated it to a high-tech, modern facility. There's a new brew house, new fermentation hall, new valving system, fancy testing systems, and some really serious automation going on here. Brewing is now a one-person operation, and fermentation is a no-person operation. It is remotely controlled. All the improvements make it look like Labatt jacked up the building and slid in a new brewery. Now we're owned by a Belgian group called Interbrew. Interbrew prides itself in being the uh, second, depending on who you talk to, we're the second or the third largest brewer in the world. But we're the, the uh, world's local brewer. In other words, every brewery that they own is actually locally run. In other words, what they do is they try to regionalize everything or localize everything versus making it a national or global. And they found some success with that. And that's part of our charm is people always associate with Rolling Rock beer with Latrobe. And, uh, and that's what's given us probably been able to sustain us through the, 
to a history. Across the state in Wilkes-Barre is a relative newcomer among Pennsylvania regional brewers, the Lion. Founded in 1901 as the Luzerne County Brewery Company, the Lion outlasted rival Stegmeyer, swallowing up its labels and those of Esslinger and Bartles. By the early 1980s, the Lion, with its 390-barrel brew house, was still brewing its own Liebenschainer cream ale and some American premium lagers but it was best known among beer lovers for the licorice-hinted, bottom-fermented Stegmeier Porter. Hard times hit the Lion in the early 1970s. The brewery was faced with some very tough decisions, either develop new operating plans or close up shop. Well, going out of business was never an option, and the Lion experimented with any new idea to come along. And some of those ideas produced some pretty unusual brews, including pioneering the drink that would guarantee the lion's future, Malta. In the early 70s, most regional brewers were having a hard time of it with the increased competition, especially from the national brands, that they had to really look at their business plans closely. The Lion Brewery, our, our decision was to diversify. In 1974, we purchased uh, the Stegmeier brand, which was a local brewery. About a million barrels a year were produced there. We bought that brand and produced it here. We're about a 390,000 barrel brewery. We also purchased the Bartels and Esslinger brands in the late 60s into the early 70s. That volume was really kept us going until the, until the 80s when we diversified into non-alcoholic products, which mainly was the Malta product. Malta is a non-alcoholic product which is brewed similar to beer with the exception that it's not fermented. It's popular with the Hispanic population, and we are currently the largest producer of malt in the United States. Besides Malta, the Lion also started contract brewing. Familiar names like Stouts, Three Stooges, and Neuweilers, plus others, all were produced by the Lion. The brewery continues to take new brands, including the popular Hopper's Hooch brands made for Bass Ale. By contract brewing, producing Malta and other sodas, and making their own brands, the Lion squeaked by. They were sold to the Quincy Partners, who in 1993 pumped a whole lot of new money and spirit into the brewery. Improvements to the plant were made, including the purchase of a new malt mill and the automation of the brew house. Yeah, one, of, one of our philosophies here at the brewery is that in the race for quality, there is no finish line. So when you're, when you're trying to achieve quality, you never let up. You constantly keep going because there is no finish line. So there's always the next day, always the next week, always the next month that you have to continue to improve on what you're doing. And uh, we've made a lot of changes in the last several years as far as quality. Um, basically, what we just did recently was add, purchased another pasteurizer. And, uh, pasteurization basically is a method of making something biologically stable. And we, we pasteurize all our beer to make sure it's stable on the shelf and that the fine quality lasts for a long time. So now we test everything in-house. So we can test everything from step one to the final step. And you get a blueprint or a fingerprint of your operation. You know what you could expect, and you know what your weaknesses are, you know what your strengths are. So you can fix your weaknesses and build up on your strengths. So that helped us. All those things added up. So now we started seeing, okay, we're having a problem here, we can fix it. We're having a problem here, we fix it. And, you know, before you knew it, everything just started coming together. New emphasis on quality control and standard procedures paid off early. The Lions scored a double goal at the Great American Beer Festival in 1994 with Liebenschainer Cream Ale and Stegmeier 1857. That's an American premium lager. Stegmeier Porter has become an honest, top-fermenting porter with a resilient boost in character. The brewery also started a new line, Brewery Hill, including a smooth black and tan, full-bodied honey amber, and Pocono raspberry. Other beers have been added, including Pocono Pilsner, the brightly aromatic pale ale, the smooth, rich Brewery Hill Caramel Porter, and the newest Saws Hop Pocono Lager. There's also a Lion Brewery Root Beer. Things continue to improve for the Lion. Master Brewer Leo Orlandini and the brewery were noted as mid-sized Brewery of the Year and Brewmaster of the Year for the Great American Beer Festival in 1999. The brewery is running at over 85% of capacity, still making Malta and other sodas, and their own brands are growing. Beer now accounts for a little over 20% of production, and that figure is increasing. How do 
microbreweries began in the United States. A guy by the name of Fritz Maytag bought the Anchor Brewery in San Francisco in the mid-1960s. Maytag was heir to the appliance fortune, so he could pretty much indulge his whim. Well, the whim turned into a love of beer making, and it's generally credited that Maytag brought the variety of beer making back to the United States. Maytag brewed and made Lighthouse Ale, what else would you make in San Francisco but Old Foghorn, and Anchor Steam. Microbreweries were alive and well and booming in the United States. These were jumped up home brewers or maverick mega brewers or just business or military people coming back from Europe who had tried the variety of beers over there and wanted to drink something like it here at home. When they couldn't find any, they started making it themselves. These um, first breweries were often cobbled together out of any kind of equipment they could find, dairy tanks or soup kettles, like Frankenstein's monster. And as you might expect, the beer was anything but uniform. Some of it was excellent, some of it was awful, but it all found a receptive audience and people who were thirsty for that kind of variety. The first microbrewery, new microbrewery in America, was New Albion in Sonoma, California, started up in the late 70s. Uh, the revolution swept westward from there, and Pennsylvania got its first microbrewers in 1986 when Penn Brewing and Dock Street both hired a brewer to start making beer for them. Pennsylvanians have discovered the many different ways beer can taste, and they like it. They like it in places like Dock Street, Philadelphia's oldest brew pub. I think the clientele that comes in here is looking for a good product. Uh, you can go just about anywhere in the city and get a Budweiser, you know. Um, there are very few places in the city where you can go in and get a very fresh, handcrafted beer. Um, and these are distinguishing clientele. It's, it's almost on the same par as people that go to, like, wine bars, you know. People come in here because they like the taste of a good, fresh beer. They like to pair it off with, um, you know, like, different types of meals. You know, it's it's... It's a good way to finish off your evening. There is so much to enjoy about Dock Street. A dazzling array of beers, heavyweights, barley wines, wheats, live real ale, plus an adventurous menu, a knowledgeable wait staff, and beer-savvy bartenders. Dock Street is a power lunch kind of place during the day. It, it comes with the territory. Suits and dresses dominate the dining room, and talk of depositions and deals fills the air. The bar itself is usually a bit more informal. In the evenings, there may be a theater crowd gradually replaced by a relaxed bunch of talkers and chalkers hanging around the pool tables. Dock Street has developed a solid reputation in Philadelphia. It is consistent, interesting, classy, handsome. It's a comfortable, relaxed place to have a beer in surroundings that give the beer a little respect. Philadelphia is the birthplace of American brewing. And just across town from Dock Street is the city's oldest continuously operating brewery, Yards Brewery, located, strangely enough, here in the back of a Pennsylvania liquor control warehouse. We're Yards Brewing Company, and we're proud to be the uh, oldest continually operating microbrewery in the city of Philadelphia. Yards and ales, all brewed in strict accordance with traditional English and Belgian methods utilizing the time-honored principles of cask and bottle conditioning to produce ales of the highest quality. Um, Yards uses traditional English brewing methods where we use a single-step infusion mash uh, to extract the sugars. We uh, use direct flame in our brewing kettle, and we use open fermentation where we actually have a top-cropping yeast that is a traditional English style that we repitch from batch to batch. But what really separates us apart from other breweries is that all of our products are conditioned in the final container they're served in. We do bottle conditioning, we do keg conditioning and cask conditioning. The respect for tradition, regardless of the effort required, characterizes Yards Brewing. When they decided to make a porter, they did it in the time-honored way, by brewing a strong ale and a mild ale, and then blending the two together to age. Their first non-British beer was a Saison, a Belgian farmhouse ale with strict yet odd fermentation requirements. Yeah, it's hard work, 
but it's paying off. The Saison became a very popular local summer beer and is selling well year-round. Yard now has a 25-barrel brew kettle and temperature-controlled tanks. You know, when Yards first opened in 1994, temperature control meant an air conditioner and a space heater. Well, they now have a bottling line and are packaging bottle-conditioned beers. The future of Yards is bright. Our goal is to bring the pre-prohibition brewing practices back to Philadelphia. We're currently expanding from a 6,000 square foot facility to a 35,000 square foot facility so we can share our product with the rest of our market. In Downingtown is the aptly named Victory Brewing Company. The two owners, Ron Barchett and Bill Kovaleski, are childhood friends who homebrewed together for years. And then through a real odd set of circumstances, they wound up brewing at the same microbrewery. Well, you know the story. One thing leads to another, and they decided to open up their own. After years of plans, salesmanship, and lots of sweat, Victory was born. And Victory does not compromise for the market because Ron and Bill believe that there is a market for uncompromising beer. Our philosophy in beer making is essentially a very selfish one uh, in that we brew only the beers that we want to drink, and we brew them to the character and the flavor that we appreciate. Uh, it's worked very well for us because luckily others have gravitated towards our beers and we have consumers appreciating them and spending for them, which keeps us in business, of course. But uh, as I said, it is a very selfish approach. Now, if you look at that from a more remote perspective, it makes some sense in the fact that Ron and I have been consumers of beer for 21 years and we have been brewing beer for 11 years and we've been brewers owners for the last five years. So we really are, we really do embody the craft brew consumer and uh, we are the craft brew consumer. Ron and Bill are uncommon beer geeks at that. That's because they brew lagers as well as ales. Of course, Pennsylvania has the largest concentration of lager microbrewers in the country. Victory's all malt lager and their big brother, St. Boisterous, are two examples of fairly uncommon styles that Victory does well and does well with. Another one is their Prima Pils. It's an unabashed Pilsner with a huge Zotz hop aroma that just blows away any lame ideas of being just another Pilsner. Finally, in late winter, they brew their St. Victorious Double Bock, a big Double Bock with a surprising hint of Beechwood smoked malt in it. Victory's flagship beer has turned out to be the powerful Hop Devil India Pale Ale. Man, that's a beer that builds a tower of hop power on a rock-solid base of German malt. You'll find more German-based ale magic in the duo of Sunrise Weiss and its Mr. Hyde-like companion, Moon Glow Weizenbach. Ooh, a very nice, very big wheat bock. Topping it off is Victory's weighty triumvirate of Old Horizontal Barley Wine, Storm King Imperial Stout, and the Belgian-style Golden Monkey. Victory's beers are winning critical acclaim all across the country, even though they're only available within about 150 miles of the brewery. The locals mail samples to their friends in other states, and the Internet beer news groups continually buzz with the praises of Victory's beers. The pub and brewery were built in part from an old Pepperidge Farms complex, so the look is very much an industrial space. The industrial feel, though, easily overlooked because the service is friendly and the food is as fresh and carefully made as the beer. Take a seat at Victory's Long Bar, a bar that's built out of the packing crates that the brewery was shipped in. Get yourself a glass of cast-conditioned hop devil fresh off a hand pump. Take a look at all the tanks behind the bar where the beer was fermented and aged. And you'll know that this isn't just great beer. This is a great place to drink beer. Welcome to the Bethlehem Brew Works, a classic example of a phenomenon called brew pub anchoring. What does that mean? Well, it means when a brew pub establishes the core for revitalization in a neighborhood. The idea is often met with initial skepticism. There's always some members of the community that feel having a brewery in their neighborhood 
will lead to public drunkenness, wanton destruction of property, decline in social values and school test scores, human sacrifice, things like that. But a brewery is primarily a production business, has good wages, local responsibilities. Most communities try to encourage that. A brew pub offers all that and more. It has a vested interest in developing and maintaining a good neighborhood that will attract customers. And that is what has happened here in Bethlehem. The Fegley's took a chance coming to downtown Bethlehem, and it worked. Now people had a place to go. When the people came, other businesses decided to take a chance on downtown as well. The brew works, well, it's always going to be different. The menu's different with items like, check this out now, garlic ale hummus, roasted red pepper mini wraps, and salmon burgers, and an ever-changing selection of fabulous house-made soup. And the decor is different, too. It's all tied to the image of Bethlehem as the home of Bethlehem Steel. The trim is skid-proof diamond plates. The booths are topped with steel pipe dividers. And the walls are studded with an old hand-carved casting pattern. It's an industrial look, but the warmth of dark wood and the street side windows ah, makes it a welcoming gathering place. Then there's the beer. Bethlehem has turned out to be a malt-loving town, and the Fag League's extra special bitter and Bag Piper's Scotch Ale are very popular taps. Jeff knows what to do with hops, too. There's always something aromatic and bitter on draft at Bethlehem, sometimes his razor-sharp IPA. He's not afraid of unconventional beer styles, either. I had a resoundingly sour and funky Belgian-style creek beer the last time I was up, and he has a very nice Belgian double as well. The brew pub is located in the heart of the historic downtown district, just up the street from this fountain that welcomes travelers and beer tourists with the message, Drink, Pilgrim, Drink. From Bethlehem, it's a short drive to Easton and the Weyerbacher Brewing Company, owned by Dan Weyerbach, the brewery's name dates to the mid-17th century, reflecting Dan's German ancestry and the original spelling of his family name. You know, Dan's always been an entrepreneur, and when the brewing bug bit him, he realized the professional opportunity of mixing his business skills and his passions. Yeah, when we started, uh, we launched our first beers in uh, autumn of 1995, and we had a real tough time. Um, getting established in the marketplace, uh, which for us is a region of about uh, two or three states. Uh, we didn't seem to have established an identity very well. We picked a few common styles that were common to other microbreweries and launched with those. Um, and after struggling a bit like this and looking for uh, something to get a toehold on the market, we hit upon a few unusual styles. And uh, as we launched a few of these, we really didn't expect much. We thought maybe, oh, uh, we'll get a a little season, another seasonal beer. After a few years of trying a number of beer styles and concepts, the brewery seems to have found its niche with an extra special bitter and India Pale Ale established as year-round beers. Dan soon started brewing only beers that were unmistakably non-mainstream. One after another, he formulated, brewed, and market-tested beers using the quick decision cycle of a microbrewery to his advantage. One of our earlier styles, uh, perhaps the second one that we tried, uh, right after Hops and Fusion, was Blithering Idiot Barley Wine. Um, we experimented. Again, it was going to be a few kegs just for sale in the brew pub. Uh, almost a novelty, sort of a fun thing for us to play around with. And um, before we knew it, uh, chatter, and I don't even know how it started, it circulated out in the marketplace a bit. And we had stores asking us about it. And we said, well, it's just going to be kegs for the brew pub. And, uh, uh, a couple of beer writers had also asked about it, and um, uh, before you know it, there was a lot of people suggesting we bottle it. So time was available at that point to brew some more before the fall season got here. It's typically a cold weather beer. And uh, we produced, uh, we tripled the size of what we had produced and uh, put it out in the marketplace. And before, before it was filtered and bottled out of the tanks, it was already sold. Uh, completely, and that was about 250 cases, which, uh, which surprised the heck out of us because here is a beer that retails for 35 or 40 dollars a case, and we just had no idea there would be that kind of a demand for that beer. 
critical acclaim and strong sales greeted the beers and Dan's testing process has been made much easier by adding a cozy pub to the brewery. The pub started out as something pretty simple. You know, a bar, a couple of tables where people could get some beers and order up a pizza, a bowl of chili, but mainly a place where Dan and his brewers could share some air with customers and find out what they really thought about the beer. Dan and his wife, Sue, were pleasantly surprised. The pub became such a popular spot in Easton that they expanded the kitchen. Adaptability is essential for smaller craft breweries to survive. Dan Weyerbach has learned that lesson very well. You can bet he'll be out selling beer on the road or behind his bar and listening to what his customers tell him. Appalachian Brewing Company is only a few years old, yet its building and equipment date back to over a century of brewery tradition. The brew house is recycled from Vancouver Island Brewery in British Columbia, Canada. The building it's located in, in Harrisburg, is a print shop dating from 1890 that took two years to renovate. Appalachian's Bottler is a used German classic, a Holdeplice long tube filler. Officials in Harrisburg evidently did some real research and saw the positive effect that a brew pub can have on its neighborhood. So they went out, they courted Appalachian, and sold them the building for one dollar. Now, considering the amount of restoration that was necessary, it was just barely a bargain. But it made the project possible for the brewers. The city viewed the brew pub as the cornerstone of its Paxton Commons project. Reclamation of the area is already starting to ripple outwards. This is one of the biggest places you'll ever feel comfortable in, with its high ceiling, the great depth of its main room, and those massive tanks behind the glass wall over there. One thing Appalachian has is plenty of room. The total floor space, 53,000 square feet, making Appalachian possibly the largest brew pub in the United States. Once the third floor is complete, they'll have more than enough room to do whatever they want. This is the only brew pub big enough to host a brewer's festival inside the pub. And Appalachian holds a great one every October. Okay, I dare you. Try sitting at the bar at Sealand Grove without hearing other people's conversations. One of the reasons I like this little brew pub is because the low background music and the lack of a television make it possible to actually hear what you're saying. Stephen Leeson and Heather McNabb say they want people to practice the art of communication, something that's all too often impossible to do in a pub. Steve and Heather are like that. They spent some time in Colorado, and it's almost impossible to spend some time there without picking up a little bit of hippie. But don't think it's all starry eyes and woo wow man with Heather and Steve. They do serious, solid work brewing, and they're good at it. They've got 20 years of brewing experience between them. The beer is knock your socks off stuff. Heather and Steve both brew, and it is impossible to tell who brews which beer. The first time I was at Sealands Grove, I tried nine beers. Seven of them were exceptional. My notes have phrases like, what a beer, real beer, reaches out and grabs you, silky smooth, fathoms deep. Steve and Heather make this beer on a classic Frankenstein brewery, cobbled together from bits and pieces taken from a lot of places, and put together by Steve, Heather, and family and friends. Financial reasons forced the two to locate in Sealands Grove, but they have made the best of it. The brew pub occupies the basement of the Snyder Mansion, which belongs to Heather's parents. We moved back to Pennsylvania to open the brew pub, and we looked at all the different communities in this area, and. My parents owned this building. It wasn't really properly utilized. So they suggested, you know, why not at least look at this space. It's an historic building. It's really interesting, or it could be very interesting. So we took a look at it. We kind of sketched it out, and we thought, hey, this could work. The couple checked into Sealands Grove history. They were looking for evidence of a brewing heritage, and they discovered a guy named Matthias App. App had a distillery in Sealands Grove, back in the early 1800s. He had a water pump at this distillery that was powered by stray dogs in a wheel, and he paid small boys to catch these dogs for him. 
Heather and Steve liked this image of a dog-powered distillery so much, they made it the symbol of their brewery. Sealands Grove is very much out of the ordinary for a brew pub. Its intimate size, fireplace, vegetarian entrees, smoke-free environment, and of course, its wide range of excellent beers help set it apart. Across the state here in Pittsburgh is the Pennsylvania Brewing Company, owned by Tom Pastorius. Uh, all of the beers we make are lager beers, meaning they're bottom fermented, uh, except for the wheat beer, which is top fermented beer, and that's a bottle conditioned, unfiltered paper Weizen, which is, we've been very fortunate to receive national acclaim, winning the gold medal at the Great American Beer Festival for Penn Weizen. And uh, our other best known beer is probably the Penn Dark, which uh, last year won the World Beer Cup, the gold medal. Loggers are underappreciated by most American beer lovers, and that's part of the reason why Pennsylvania Brewing had a long and hard climb to become Pennsylvania's biggest microbrewer. Loggers are more labor-intensive than ales, use more energy, and they stay in the tanks longer, which means the same amount of tankage produces less lager than ale in a year. Customers don't see this, they don't care about the extra cost, so they won't pay more for the beer. Penn Gold has grabbed the Great American Beer Festival gold medal three times over nine years. That's some pretty good proof of Penn's mastery of both the Munich Helles style and lager brewing in general, because there's nowhere at all to hide on this pristine, lightly malty beer. The brewery's flagship Penn Pilsner is still brewed partly under contract at Jones Brewing because of the sheer volume it represents. After two years of selling, scrimping, saving, sweating, Pastorius opened his brewery pub on Pittsburgh's north side in the old Eberhardt and Ober Brewery. The pub is a beauty of German style and functionality. The place settings, tablecloths, and food preparations are uniformly excellent. And of course, it goes without saying, the beer is outstanding. So we're looking forward to the future. In fact, we are in a major expansion of the capacity of our Penn Brewery right now, where we are going to increase the capacity by 50% in the next couple of months. Beautiful sunsets, sandy beaches, and great beer. Erie Brewing is all by itself in the northwest corner of the state and has its work cut out for itself. How does a brewery survive without other brewers around to climb the pump for people's tastes? Well, very well, I'm happy to report. From its birth in the former Hopper's Brew Pub across town in 1994, through its new incarnation as a packaging microbrewery, Erie Brewing Company has been buoyed by great community support. Erie loves Railbender Ale. This big malty beer falls somewhere between an English old ale and a wee heavy. And it's got more than a lot of malt and more than a touch more alcohol than most beers have. At 6.8% alcohol, it's quite a bit bigger than most beers, yet it accounts for 70% of the brewery's output. They're a different breed up in Erie, and my hat's off to them. You know, I think they, uh, certainly our product line uh, is something that we've put a lot of thought into and has helped us, uh, if you will, maintain that community support that's so valuable to us. And we haven't tried to confine ourselves in, the, in a very specific high-end niche uh, craft product. Uh, our products are very good, and certainly and clearly our craft products in terms of the way they're made. We, we have two uh, ales, uh, our Railbender Ale, which is a traditional Scottish ale, uh, and our Matt Anthony's Ale, which is designed really as an English pub ale. And very importantly to our thought process, I guess, as we have evolved, was to enter into what is not traditionally seen in the craft brewing business, and that's to begin the lagering business and the launch of our Presque Isle Pilsner. Uh, that has allowed us to reach what we believe to be a market that's saturated with the mentality of uh, drinking and, and believing that beer is really the traditional American style beers, which are very good and serve their purpose. But uh, you know, we wanted to reach uh, that marketplace and still have the craft uh, edge to it in terms of uh, uh, the, the freshness and crispness of the beer. So our Presque Isle Pilsner is certainly backfilled for us there. Erie Brewing does well in the community in which it does business because the community supports it and wants to see it grow into a vibrant and regional brewery. 
We think it fitting to bring an end to our tour of Pennsylvania breweries right here in Erie because no other city in the Commonwealth has this poignant or a stark reminder of what happens when the community stops buying locally. This is what happens. Behind me, the former Kohler Brewery, home to Kohler Beer, Uncle Jackson, and the famous Kohler Caller. This once proud building, which employed hundreds and hundreds of people, is now nothing more than urban blight, a painful eyesore that keeps reminding us how well national products are marketed. So the next time you're ordering up a glass of suds, say to your bartender, hey, make mine local, make mine Pennsylvania. You can order a VHS copy of Pennsylvania Breweries by visiting www.wqln.org forward slash beer or by calling 1-800-727-8854.